In the last portion of chapter five is what we call gastroequiometry. And this is, of course, again, about mole ratios and balancing equations and everything. But now you're using the gas law instead of using um, the normal kind of stoichiometry in which you were using grams and converting into moles. You will still do that. But in some cases, you can get away with just uh, using the gas law to find the number of moles. So in any case, this is about uh, gas stoichiometry. And there are some other aspects also in this, like the van der Waals equations and some deviations from the ideal gas. So just like we have in solid stoichiometry and liquid stoichiometry, uh, we have to calculate moles. For everything here also, you can calculate the moles and grams uh, and liters okay, of the uh, reactants and products. The only difference is that you have to use the ideal gas law okay, to um, calculate these things. So PV is equal to NRT is the formula that we use. Um, and of course, the same thing as before, when we use moles, uh, those can be calculated from uh, molar mass. We also have to have an equation to get the coefficients um, and the equation should be balanced so that we get the right. So for example, when a two liter bottle of concentrated HCl was spilled, 1.2 kilograms of calcium carbonate was required to neutralize the spill. What volume of carbon dioxide was released by the neutralization? So, um, here is your equation that is given to you, okay, which is calcium carbonate and uh, HCl to give calcium chloride. Now, remember, we talked about this back in chapter four, that um, uh, carbonic acid will give you water. One of the most common application of uh, Dalton's pressure, uh, partial pressure is when collecting gases over water. So a lot of the reactions that we do in the lab um, have gases that come out of the reaction or as a product. And so those gases are usually collected over water, especially if you're trying to see how much you get. Okay, so to collect them, you collect them over water because if you collect them in a one liter container, then you really don't know how much gas was evolved. Okay, because remember gases will take the space um, all the space okay, that is given to them. So what happens is that uh, when you collect gas over water, the gas will actually displace the water. And so then you can measure how much gas is being involved. So uh, when such kind of a reaction takes place and you're displacing the water, then the gas pressure okay, that you end up getting is not just the gas pressure, but also the vapor pressure of water. Okay, and so, um, you have to, in order to find the pressure that is exerted just by the gas, you need to subtract the vapor pressure of water. The partial pressure of water depends only on the temperature, okay? And uh, it depends on the temperature because as the temperature increases, the vaporization of water increases. And so therefore it will exert more pressure. So uh, what you have to do is then um, look up a table and find the pressure of water at a certain temperature and then subtract um, that from the total pressure. So right here, this diagram shows how the gas is actually collected um, inside. So here's an inverted cylinder, okay? And um, the gas is usually collected from in here. And once it's collected in here, the water is displaced, okay? But the pressure that is being exerted is the pressure of the gas plus the water. Here is the chart for the vapor pressure of water at different temperatures. And these are standard values, and this is not something that you have to memorize, but you can just look at the chart, okay? So um, if the temperature is zero degrees centigrade, the pressure is 4.6 millimeters of Hg. And you can see that as the temperature is increasing, so is the pressure, okay, of water. And that's because vaporization is increasing. So uh, hypothetically speaking, if you were collecting any gas um, or hydrogen over water, then the total pressure that you end up getting will be the one for uh, hydrogen as well as water at that temperature. So for example, if you were doing this at 19 degrees centigrade, then um, the way you would find the pressure of hydrogen would be the total pressure minus the vapor pressure of water at 19 degrees centigrade, which is 16.5. And so this is then the partial pressure of hydrogen, okay, at that point. So, which is slightly less than what was the total pressure. Um, it does make a little bit difference in your calculations. It's not a big difference, but it is uh, meaningful, okay? So you have to remember to do this small calculation, okay, in case uh, your problem reads, um, 
collecting gas over so here is an example um, let's say you prepare nitrogen gas by heating ammonium nitrite and if you collect the nitrogen over water at 23 degrees Celsius and 727 millimeters of mercury, how many liters of gas would you obtain from 5.68 grams of ammonium nitrite? So here are your numbers, okay, where your pressure is 727. So this is the total pressure, by the way. 727 is the total pressure that's given to you. And since you know that the gas is being collected over water, you will find the pressure of water at 23 degrees centigrade, which is 21.1 millimeters of mercury. So which means that the partial pressure of the gas, which is nitrogen, would be uh, 727 minus 21, which gives us 706, okay, 706 millimeters of mercury. So then here's the temperature. And then you find the molar mass of uh, ammonium nitrite. You calculate the moles um, of ammonium nitrite. And once you have the moles, then you go ahead and plug it in the uh, gas, ideal gas equation, PV is equal to NRT. Again, we are calculating the volume, okay, over here. So volume stays uh, up here, P comes down here. So N, which is number of moles, R is gas constant, T is temperature which is 296 and then pressure would be then 706, which has to be converted into atmospheres. Okay, so here is your setup for the problem. And here is your answer. If you did not do the subtraction, okay, which means if you had 727, then your answer is going to be slightly smaller. And uh, sometimes that can lead to problems, especially if you have multiple choice questions. Uh, but even otherwise, um, you should still do the subtraction, okay, if you're collecting any kind of gas over water. Here is a nice problem on collecting uh, gas over water as well as stoichiometry, okay? So let's read the problem. Oxygen was produced and collected over water at 22 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 754 torr. Now remember 754 torr is the total pressure, okay? And this is the gas collected over water. The, the equation that's given to us is uh, potassium chlorate that uh, decomposes to give potassium chloride and oxygen. Luckily, it's balanced for us. Um, so then it goes on to read 325 milliliters of gas were collected and the vapor pressure of water is given at uh, 22 degrees, it is 21 torr. The question is calculate the number of moles of oxygen and the mass of potassium chlorate that decomposed. All right, so um, get all your uh, data in order first and then we'll try and compose a strategy. So our total pressure that we have is 750 torr and um, the amount of oxygen that's being collected, okay, over here. So that is, um, that's going to be this pressure here and the pressure of water is 21 torr at that uh, temperature. So then we do the subtraction, we find the pressure of oxygen, divide that by 760 to get the atmospheres. That is just a conversion. The amount of gas collected was 325 milliliters, which is also 0.325 liters. So do the conversion there, do the conversion for the temperature, we can convert it to Kelvin, okay, from Celsius. And then we go ahead and set up our equation. Now we are calculating the number of moles, okay? So you have pressure given to you, the volume and temperature given to you and gas constant. So PV is equal to NRT, what you're calculating for is then N, okay, in there. So N of oxygen, moles of oxygen, is then your, your pressure over here, the liters and divided by RT, okay, which is 1.29 times 10 to the negative two moles of oxygen. So that is your first part of the problem. Calculate the number of moles of oxygen. See, quite straightforward, okay, there is not much to it. The only thing you have to remember here is to uh, get the right pressure. The second part of the problem now is um, calculate the mass of uh, potassium chlorate decomposed, okay, from here. Now, this is where the stoichiometry actually comes through, okay, because what you've just calculated is the moles of oxygen, which is actually right here, and you're being asked to calculate the mass, mass of uh, potassium chlorate. 
So in order to calculate the mass of potassium chlorate, you have to set up a stoichiometric calculation, which means the mole ratio and all that good stuff, okay, that we did back when. So you need your equation because from here, you will get the mole ratio of potassium chlorate to oxygen. And then here is a beautiful setup where we have the moles of oxygen and then the mole ratio where we have two moles of potassium chlorate to three moles of oxygen. And then, of course, you convert the potassium chlorate to grams, okay, of potassium chlorate, which is then 1.06 um, grams of potassium chlorate. What does this problem mean for us? It meant that if you had 1.06 grams of potassium chlorate, it will give us 325 milliliters of oxygen, okay, which is collected over water. So that's really what this problem tells. Uh, one of the last few things to talk about is the speed of gas, okay, which is given by this formula, mu RMS, um, which is the root mean square speed, is given by square root of 3RT over M, and M is the molecular weight, and T is the temperature, R is the gas constant. Uh, this formula tells you also that the speed of gas is dependent on temperature, and the molecular weight okay, of the gas. R is a constant, so that doesn't really affect us. So um, these two graphs over here show us a nice comparison okay, of these two things. So the first graph here is for the temperature. So let's take nitrogen over here at different temperatures. okay. And so as the temperature increases, the speed of the gas also increases, which makes perfect sense because as you're increasing the temperature of a gas, you're providing it with more energy. And if it has more energy, it's going to move faster. Okay, so that is this left graph. On the right hand graph, it shows the dependence of the mass and molecular speed. So if the mass is small, then the gas is moving faster. If the gas is heavier, like chlorine, the gas is moving slower, okay, which also makes perfect sense because if you have a heavier gas with a larger mass, it will not be able to move as fast, okay? And so um, if you think about the uh, noble gases going from helium to uh, neon, argon, and so on, and the last gas is radon, by the time you come to radon, it's going to be a very heavy gas and it's not going to move as much. So it's the same concept over here. And so um, this is uh, what the speed of gas is. Now, again, as I said, we will not be using this formula because uh, we will not be doing the calculations of this. I focus a lot more on stoichiometry than the calculation of speed of gas. Two other terms that are important for us are diffusion and effusion. Diffusion is when a gas will spread out okay, by um, uniform space. So, uh, for example, if you have um, something cooking in the oven, then all the flavor is coming out of the oven, okay? That kind of a thing. Um, a fusion is a different kind of a process. A fusion is when the gas is actually coming out from a particular location, okay, in a container. So, for example, if you have a container of gas, like balloon, for example, and it gets a puncture, okay? And so if it has a puncture, it has a hole in it, then that's where the gas is coming out from, okay? And uh, these two processes of uh, gas evolution, okay, from a source are different because the spreading of the gas from diffusion is much faster than it would be from effusion, okay? Because effusion, there will be just a small part from where the gas is coming out, whereas in case of diffusion, it's, it's a whole big thing. So for example, trees will go ahead and um, use diffusion, okay, for gas uh, transfer. Whereas in case of transportation of gases, for example, natural gas or something like that, then effusion is a problem um, when there's a hole in the pipe, okay, for example. So uh, then you have to find out the location of that particular um, hole and then close it, okay, or whatever the case might be. So in any case, these are two different terms, diffusion and effusion. And then, of course, there are real gases, okay? So, so far, we've been talking about what's called the ideal gas, okay? So in an ideal gas, the gases will behave ideally, which means a perfect gas where there is no attraction, there is no repulsion, um, and then the volume of the gas is exactly the same as the volume of the container, okay? And so 
that would be the ideal gas but in reality it's not like that okay it's just like human beings you know you want an ideal human being but then you end up getting something which is a little bit more realistic okay and so those are real gases then and in case of real gases then there will be other factors involved for example um, where you have attraction and repulsion going on and then um, the volume of the container will start matter uh, will start to matter because if some gases are very small very tiny like hydrogen then the way they occupy space is very different from a gas that is large like carbon dioxide okay and so at that point deviations start to occur from real uh, from ideal gases so for to uh, to compensate for that um, there is a formula that we use and that's on the next slide so the formula is called the van der waals equation and the van der waal equation accommodates for two things then okay volume and pressure and so the way the volume is accommodated for is that something is subtracted to account for the space between the molecules so uh, as we know that molecules don't really completely occupy the entire space the molecules are smaller uh, than the actual space because the gases can be compressed so therefore to account for that uh, there is a little subtraction and then pressure is a little bit different and this is um, a small value is added to account for the attraction and repulsion between molecules okay that's between the gas molecules and how that affects the pressure is because if there is attraction repulsion going on then they will collide differently with the gas wall container okay the molecules uh, will collide differently not the same way as if there was an ideal gas all right and so uh, a and b here n is the number of moles a and b are constants b is the volume over here so a b the constants can be found um, in any textbook so uh, here is the ideal gas law pv is equal to nrt and here is the new uh, equation okay and this one is for the real gases then so pressure is changed a little bit and then the volume is changed here a little bit and that is equal to rt and so this is the van der waal equations which is used for um, real gases okay not for ideal gases ideal gases we can still get away with pv is equal to nrt it's worth mentioning that in general most of the times um, ideal gases will be just fine real gases behave like ideal gases um, but under certain circumstances, uh, ideal gases start behaving like real gases. So, for example, when a gas is compressed too much, then the gas molecules will come much closer together and then they will start behaving a little bit differently. So, you have to then account for the volume. And the other place where or the other condition where um, gas will start behaving a little bit differently from ideal gas is when the temperature is really high because if the temperature is really high then um, gas molecules will be moving around a little bit too much so those kind of conditions will lead to uh, deviations from ideal gases and finally your key points for this um, powerpoint is of course knowing about gas stoichiometry so be able to calculate um, how many liters of gas will be formed or consumed collecting gases over water now remember i will give you the values that you need for vapor pressure of water but you still need to just do that little bitty calculation where you need to do the subtraction of uh, the vapor pressure of water from the total pressure um, then just a little bit you should know about the gas mixture as to the key terms diffusion and effusion and a little bit about the molecular speeds uh, regarding the deviation from the ideal behavior yes please um, you may not need to know the van der waal equation but you do need to know the factors that call the that cause deviation so just kind of review that a little bit um, if you don't understand it go back and read it again